Well, I am not sure if I, uh, you know, it's kind of a confession, if I was ever really prepared to be a pastor. I'm not sure if anybody is ever really prepared to be a pastor. I thought this job was going to be a job where I got to work one day a week, preach a sermon, <laughs> shake some hands, and go home. But honestly, without kidding aside, pastoring what I've learned over the years, requires you to walk with people through the valley of the shadow of death. That's one of the main jobs we have. Another is to pray with people who are experiencing what is called the dark night of the soul. And so what I'd say, one of the biggest struggles I have with pastoring is how do you answer people when death comes unexpected? How do you comfort someone who feels like they've been robbed from all their hopes and dreams. A baby dies in their crib. A husband loses his young bride unexpectedly. A routine outpatient surgery turns deadly. Or a widow maker claims another middle-aged father from his home. Have you ever noticed that the world we live in is really, 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 really like really broken, like it's really broken. I have found that even the corruption and the depravity and the degradation around us can leave us scarred and our soul just soar week after week after week if you let it in too much. A couple years ago, I was watching a documentary on my computer. And when you go on YouTube, a lot of times they have an algorithm. They said, hey, if you like this, you'll probably like this. And what popped up on my computer screen were these videos from an organization called Soft White Underbelly. Any of you guys ever hear the Soft White Underbelly? I'll tell you what, man. The very first one I saw was this story about this West Virginian guy by the name of Ray who was severely handicapped because of inbreeding. And it was maybe one of the most shocking thing I've seen as a documentary. So the person who made this video and these video series will do a lot of different interviews, and what he wants to do is he wants to go underneath what he calls a soft white underbelly of America and find the invisible in society. So here's pictured some of the people he's interviewed. So on the far left is Ray is on the far left. Those are his brothers. They are inbreds from West Virginia. Ray actually just died about six months ago, but in the video, all he could do is bark like a dog. The next guy is a guy who was severely burned in a house fire. That's how he was left. This lady up here on her right, at the age of 12, she was a beautiful blonde-haired girl that was trafficked, and now she's so ashamed, she just tries to put on as much body art, piercings, tattoos, and if you notice her eyes are tattooed black because she's so ashamed. Down on the far left is a guy who is a fentanyl addict. Joined a gang to get more of it, but he is just a broken man. In the middle is a lady that got so many, basically, tattoos and plugs because she wanted to look like a lizard. And then on the far right is just a homeless man, and he became homeless because he's addicted to opioids. Story after story, this website deals, details the sad, poor, strange, sick, and they come into an interview on Skid Row in L.A. because they get a few bucks, so why not do it? And they tell their story, and each story is heartbreaking. It kind of reminds me of the song by the Beatles, Eleanor Rigby, All the Lonely People. Where do they all come from? All the lonely people where do they all belong? And the question I have is how do we, as Christians, as pastors, make sense of this world? Like, how do we figure this out? Usually people say, well, there's three answers. The first answer I'm just going to call the shallow cliche, especially if you go to a funeral and it's devastating. You always have that one person says, well, at least they're now in a better place. That doesn't help. Or you look at some of these people and say, well, they did it to themselves. Did Ray do it to himself? 
to, to a degree, shallow cliches are just thoughtless phrases that make a person angry and more empty and more hopeless than they were before. The second kind of answer, you can actually be honest if you are a materialist and just say, if there's no God, honestly, I've got no answers. There is no hope. One philosopher said that what you basically are seeing here, and he's talking about when you look around in society and you see chaos, all chaos really is is the outworking of evolution. So we shouldn't be surprised. Ooh, boy, that really brings me a lot of hope. Or you could say, God does have an answer. So if there's a real God, does he have anything to say? And I would say he does, but before you listen, do you want to hear his answer? Because man, does he have answers. And as for me, one of the most important sections of Scripture to figure out what's wrong with this world is found in Ephesians chapter 2. If you could turn there, 1 through 10. We're continuing our study on taking a view of what's going on in the world from the top down. So like we've been saying, this is really Ephesians is God's perspective, the gospel from his perspective. Now we're going to see from his perspective what is really going on, what's wrong. And what I would say is when the world becomes distorted, fuzzy, you don't understand what's happening, I would I would invite you to learn this section, to know what's going on, because it will help you sift. It's like a filter. See reality as it is. So I'm going to call it basically, but God. It's reality from his point of view, and you'll see why I'm calling it but God. So let's start chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. As for you, Paul writes, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world in the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. Some versions say the lust of our flesh. Following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, and this is where but God comes in, but because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us up with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved. Through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's what we're going to look at. Jesus gave a similar promise, a single verse in the book of John, that I think Paul is going to flesh out fully here. The verse is John 5.24, and I think John 5.24, truthfully, is one of the most important verses ever to learn. I would encourage you to learn it, but it's, it's a promise. And Jesus says this, very simple. And you got to listen to how he says it. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. So you will possess eternal life. And then Jesus says, you won't be judged, but you've crossed over from death to life. So Jesus said, I'm telling you the truth. If you believe in me, you will cross over from death, the dark side. You'll take a bridge over to life. I believe that's exactly what's going on all through Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Verses 1 through 3, he's going to define the problem, why we are dead. He's going to, like, he's going to do an autopsy on humanity and why humanity is so messed up. Why there is such a thing as the soft white underbelly. And then he's going to talk about the bridge in verse 4, how this bridge then takes us over to the solution for the problem. 
But it's not just a solution, it's his solution. He, de- he devised it, designed it, and he delivered it. And because he delivered it, he deserves all credit for it. We don't boast in it. We boast in one thing, grace, grace alone. So before we kind of go into Ephesians 2, I want, you, I want to develop one principle you have to see. And I'm going to take some time on this. And here's the principle, because this is very important in life. The wonder of salvation, and by wonder of salvation, that which gets me excited, the joy that is birthed in my heart, the overwhelming gratitude I live with, the wonder of salvation is identically proportionate to the degree of condemnation. In other words, if we know we're in deep trouble, our need for rescue will be of primary and urgent concern. However, if we're not really in danger, who cares? We might as well get a beer, go watch some more football, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. You know what? Who cares if we die? Because there's nothing to worry about. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it like this. This is really a great statement. He says, why is it that people do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Why is it that people are not Christians and not members of the Christian church? Why does the Lord Jesus Christ not come into their calculations at all? In the last analysis, there's only one answer to that question. So he's going to say, do you want to know why people aren't Christians? Here's the answer. They don't believe in him because they've never seen any need for him. And they've never seen any need for him because they've never realized that they're sinners and they've never realized that they're sinners because they've never realized the truth about the holiness of God and the justice and the righteousness of God. They've never known anything about God as this judge who sends wrath. If we really believe in salvation and our absolute need of Jesus, we must start here with man's problem. We must start with the doctrine of sin. And so, if you notice... Verse 1, Paul writes, as for you, you were dead. That's where it begins. You were dead. And dead in this context means you were spiritually separated from the life of God. That's what death means, separation from. And it's separation from the life of God. And our future is without hope because we can't save ourselves. We, because we're dead, we can't save ourselves. So you could say it like this. Hopelessness, brokenness, poverty, sickness, loneliness, sorrow, suffering. Why does a 12-year-old girl get trafficked? Why is there opium problems and meth problems and fentanyl problems? It's the outworking of death. It's death. And death is caused by three things. Number one, sin. Look what it says in verse one. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. There is what I'd call the condition of sin, capital S, and then there is the outworking of sin, small t, trespass, and small s, sins. So trespasses and sins are a sign that sin lives in me. And if you remember, the very first promise God gave to Adam was this. It's kind of a negative. It's a warning. Hey, Adam, if you sin, you die. And I don't think he believed to the degree that God was talking about. God was not bluffing. As sure as the sun is hot, sin always results in death, chaos, confusion. So you could say sin is a general condition, trespass is the outworking of it. We are all born into sin, and our trespasses prove that we are. In the same way, how do I tell what kind of tree it is? If there's red apples on a tree, I know that's an apple tree. If I have ever sinned, ever once, James says if I sin at one point, that, like an apple, shows the evil fruit that sin resides in me. So the question is, have you ever trespassed, broken the law of God, willfully disobeyed the pure standards, 
And if you have, that's sin. Verse 3 elaborates how sin works. Look at verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh. I'm going to say that's lust of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. So three terms we have to talk about is lust of the flesh, the desires or the craving of the body, which is sensuality, and then the desires of the mind, which is worldly pride, superiority, wanting to be on top. So lust of the flesh basically means inside my body, it demands, commands, and wants things that God doesn't want. So when lust kicks in, <clears throat> both our body and our mind demands action. When a person doesn't have God, this is what's scary. When a person does not have God, it is with impossible to withstand the cravings of lust. It's almost impervious. It urges us on. It drives us to grab. Look at it like this. <clears throat> I heard a story about a poor mother. She was very poor. She had two daughters. And her do daughters wanted to have the same kind of clothes, the same kind of parties, the same kind of things as her friends. So the mother's saying, I'm going to make sure my daughters have everything they want. So she begged, borrowed, stole, credited her way to get what she wanted for them. And somebody says, why do you do that? Because she says they have to have the very best. And because I want it, <clears throat> I'm going to get it. That's lust. That's lust. There's no discussion, she said. My mind is made up. I'm going to have it, and I'm going to have all of it. So the lust of the flesh works through food, sleeps, fun, sex, money, entertainment. And then the, basically the mind thinks it deserves it. So when God says no, just wait, pray, lust kicks in and says, God, get out of my way. Pride gets mad when God says no. Pride believes, I'm special, so I should get it. I know everybody else should wait, but not me, because I kind of deserve it. And so the consequence is God says, well, if you're going to override my warnings, it's going to end badly. That's what the soft white underbelly is all about. That's what he wants to protect us from. But lust doesn't care. It demands it to be so. Even throwing caution to the wind, I'm going to have what I want. And now, look around, watch TV. We are reaping the whirlwind. Second uh, thing that causes death is Satan. Look at verse 2. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work. He is now at work. So this is talking about Satan as if he's a certainty and as if he actually dwells today. Who's he at work in? Oh, those who are being driven by lust. So there's a real villain who has been released upon our world. He hates us, and he wants us dead. That's why Jesus says the thief has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He uses the fear of death as his weapon, and we are his prey, and he's powerful. How does he control us? Jesus says through lies. He uses positive lies. If you do what I say, you're going to have pleasure and grandeur. Jesus, if you just bow down to me, you can have all the kingdoms of the world. And he uses negative lies. If you don't do what I say, I'm going to cause you pain, suffering, and death. So he uses both of them. And they all come out of the very first lie. Do you know what the very first lie was he told? It's this, and they're all fashioned the same way. All of his lies are the same way, and it's this. Did God, and he says it with that English accent, did God really, because he, he sounds intelligent, did God really say, 
If you eat, you will die. Did he really say that? Because once he gets you to question God's truth, everything else is up for grabs. If you can question his truth, everything becomes silly putty. He can turn it into anything he wants. Did God really say marriage is between a man and a woman? Did he? Did he really? Did God really say that the marriage bed is the only pure place for sex? Did he really say that? Did God really say stealing and coveting and bearing false witness is wrong? Is it really wrong to bear false witness? Is it really wrong for a politician to lie to you even though he's, he's lying to you? Isn't votes worth the lies? Hmm. And what is so bad with murder? What is so wrong with murder, especially if the thing you're getting rid of is just unwanted fetal tissue? Did God really say? Yes! He did say that. Jesus says, Satan was a liar from the very beginning, and if you think about it, he's a creature, so as a creature, he only increases in knowledge. So if he was a liar from the beginning, just think how good he is 6,000 years later. Wow. And then the third thing is what causes death is this fear of hell, fear of condemnation. Look at the end of verse 3. The end of verse 3 says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of, of what? Ra deserving of wrath? Yes. Ooh, I don't like that. I don't like that. But this is saying heavenly justice demands payment for earthly sin. Because when we follow the lives of Satan, when we rebel and follow lust, there's a breach. It's like there's a rip in the perfect order of shalom that he made, and he's got to fix it. It's like he's got to weld it together because this rip is causing all kind of problems. Or you could look at it like this. In the same way that salvation rewards us with eternal life, the proportionate consequence of rejecting salvation is eternal damnation. But it isn't just proportionate. It's not just appropriate proportionately. It's also just. In God's courts, sin and allegiance to the devil must be atoned for. It must be atoned for. The consequences of a poison world need to be expiated or sucked out. It must be paid for in full because if the breach or the offense is not fixed, it's also deep and wide and it never ends. So this is where my A slide comes in. My A slide is on this issue of hell. Between you and me, I hate the concept of hell. I don't like it. I don't like it at all, and I can't comprehend it. It makes no sense to me. And the devastating reality that those who don't know Christ, even those that I, I knew and are my friends, those who don't know Christ are in, like, real trouble, like eternal punishment that never ends kind of trouble. I once had a gentleman come into my office, and uh, he insisted, he looked at me, he insisted that anyone who still believes in hell and even teaches hell has no compassion, they have no mercy, and they're just cruel. He said to allow people to believe in hell as a pastor is just mean, and he said it right to me. And so I looked at him and I said, listen, I don't believe in hell because I'm callous and I want the non-believer to suffer. That's not why I believe in hell. I believe in hell because scripture teaches it is true. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes this, if you believe the Bible is divinely inspired, then you must not say, but I don't understand it, nor can I grasp it, and because I cannot grasp it, it must be immoral to believe it. Of course you don't understand it. Who can understand such things? 
being mere mortal. But belief in hell is not a question of understanding. It is a question of whether you believe the scriptures or not. Death is our problem. It's our problem. And we must dwell on it because, as I said before, the depth of the problem informs us how amazing the solution is. Oh, and it's amazing. And that's where verse 4 comes in. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. In most other versions it says, But God, because of his love for us, is rich in mercy. So you could say, The bridge from death to life is but God. But is what they would call, English people would call, coordinating conjunctive word meaning, Everything that happened before the word but, so that'd be everything that happened in verses 1 and 3, will be completely corrected and changed by what comes after. It is a connector. It's a bridge connecting death to life. So you could say, yes, we were dead, but something happened. What is that something God happened. Where the mighty love of God happened, and love is mighty in the sense that it is able to completely and utterly, it is able to completely and utterly bridge the gap that death caused. Can overcome it, and it can overwhelm it. And by the way, Doc, don't worry about it. It, you know, when I, hear your, when I hear her talk, it's like I hear my sister. I love it. I love it. Abs- everybody's welcome to the gospel, right? Man, I love it. So thank you for bringing her, honestly. She's a gift. And so, Scripture says where sin abounds, grace much, much more abounds. Romans 5.15, but the gift is not like the trespass. If the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So look at it like this. I can start a forest fire, this little match, and start a forest fire. And let's say I go to California and I set a pine tree on fire, it will start setting the whole countryside on fire. To extinguish that fire, I need a lot of water maybe millions upon millions of gallons of water to quench the fire. Jesus' death quenched the fire that sin started. Sin started the fire. Ryan didn't start the fire. Sin started the fire. And that fire that is raging has been (laughs) extinguished by the depth of the riches of the love of God established in Christ Jesus. It's incredible. So you could say the cross is the tangible expression. That cross is the tangible expression of God's love. It's God's love in action. Listen, so here's what's amazing. So sin brings death, right? You hear me say that? Sin brings death. But Jesus on the cross became sin to put death to death. So Satan wanted to use our rebellion to get back at the Father. He wanted to humiliate God through us. Jesus used this weapon that Satan thought would stop Jesus, and he used the weapon against Satan to humiliate him. Colossians says he was completely embarrassed. He didn't know what was going to hit him. It's the great reversal. And then here's the most beautiful thing. Wrath is our penalty. When Jesus was on the cross, the wrath of God was poured out on him. And he said, it is finished. So that means God's anger is over. There's no wrath. It's the love of God expressed beautifully. That's why Paul says in Galatians 6.14, may I never boast, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the cross is all God's doing. Verse 4 says, look what verse, verse 4 says, because of his great love for us, God is rich in 
mercy. So it's the expression of his kindness to us. He loves us. I love how Isaiah puts it. Watch how Isaiah puts it. He was prophesying the future, and he said, although you were angry with me, he's talking about God, your anger has turned away, and you, God, have comforted me. And then he says, surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. And I think he's kind of excited at the end here. The Lord, it's the Lord who's my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. So this leads us across the bridge. Death, the bridge is but God, and we get to life, which is found only in Christ. That's verse 5 and 6. Look at 5 and 6. Verse 5 and 6 said he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Three with Christ, one in Christ. So what is the answer? Life is found in his son who was given to us as our gift. And in him we have regeneration. We have new life. That's what verse 5 says. Regeneration is the idea of metamorphosis. I once was like a caterpillar, but now I'm a butterfly. I'm completely different. And we have resurrection. Jesus seats us with him in the heavenly realm. We are raised up positionally. So you could say the first thing, we have power for life, and we have a positional change. It's positional. And it's all God's grace. It's all God's grace. Look at verse 5. It is by grace you've been saved. Grace means he did it because he loves you. He wants you. And then what he does is with this new life, it gives us power over sin. So you could say, basically, basically, lust no longer controls us. We have a new spirit. We don't have to obey anymore. We can say, nope, I am going to trust God. And then this is the beautiful thing about resurrection. It says we are seated with him in the heavenly realms. The question is, why is Christ seated? Here's why he's seated. In the Old Testament, when a priest would offer sacrifices, he never sat down because he was never done giving sacrifices. Once Jesus gave his body, God was okay with it, so he sat down and he's completely at rest. So when I'm sitting with Jesus, I'm at rest. It's over. Stop working. He did it all. So, death, the bridge, and now I live in life. The question is, how do I get this? How do I apply it? Because it's not just given to me. How do I, practically speaking, cross the bridge? How do I take the provided solution and apply it? This is where verse 8 and 9 come in. Watch verse 8 and 9, probably the most famous of this passage. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, there's some question here. Here's a couple questions. Number one, verse 9 says we don't, we don't do anything to achieve. So it's not by works. We cannot do it. We cannot achieve grace on our own so we don't boast. But then verse 8 kind of reads weird. It says, through faith. But isn't faith a work? Isn't believing a work? So look at verse 8. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. What is this? Some people think this is grace. Some people think this means faith. I think it means both, grace and faith. Let me give you an illustration. Is it kind of hot in here today? Kind of hot, right? Because I see people falling asleep. Am I that boring today? I'm boring. All right, so I'll wake you up. Because I see people, don't yawn. This is the greatest passage. I'll try to be more entertaining. That, 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 no, here it is. This will entertain you. How do I make sense out of eight and nine? It's this. Faith is like a fork. Let me explain it to you. I'm hungry. Let's say I'm hungry. And I haven't eaten in two days. And you know, I'm going to die because I haven't eaten in two days. And I come home, and I lie on the couch, and I say, woe is me, I'm going to die. I haven't eaten in two days. So my wife comes in, and she says, my poor husband's going to die. He needs to eat. So she goes to the kitchen to make me my favorite food, spaghetti. She makes me spaghetti with the best meat sauce you ever had. 
You can smell it. You smell that spaghetti? See, this will wake you up. You smell the spaghetti? She puts it on a white plate. We have really nice, thick plate. She puts it on a white plate. And I'm lying on the couch. Woe is me. I'm going to die. She puts it right on the table. It's like a little table, and I'm lying, and she puts it right by my head so I can smell it. It smells so good. And I said, but I can't eat this. I can't eat this. I need help. So she goes in, and she goes, I know. I'll get you a fork. She gets me a fork, and she puts it next to me. And so now I realize I can access this spaghetti by the fork. So I start eating with the, it's amazing how a fork works. I twirl a little bit of spaghetti and I eat it and I chop some of the spaghetti up and I eat it. But this fork helps me eat the spaghetti and I eat all of it and I'm alive. Oh, I feel great. My eyes open up. Everything's wonderful. My wife comes in and she says, how do you like it? I said, it was really good, but I did all this. Well, what do you mean? Like, what do you want me to thank you or something? You want me to think you did this for me? I ate that spaghetti with the fork. What do you mean? (laughs) Not just anybody can use a fork. I did this. I ate it with the fork. And if you're saying, what is wrong with you, Chris? I would say, what is wrong with people who think faith is a work? Faith accesses the life of Christ. When I believe, like the fork, I access his life and I'm alive. That faith is not anything to be proud of. It's how God designed you. And when you start applying faith, believing that Jesus actually died for you and rose again, life comes in you, your eyes open, and you are different. And for you to take any credit for that, there is something wrong with you. We don't boast. Jesus did it all. All To him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And that leads to the very last verse. Why did he do all this? Because of verse 10. Look at verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, creating Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So what is the point of salvation? Why does God save me? Does God save me so I'm saved? Kind of, but God doesn't really save me to be saved. He saves me to be displayed. It's a huge difference. Massive difference. We have so many churches, all it's about is just getting saved, and then we're done. Joel, my my brother-in-law, one of his favorite phrases is, we don't just catch the fish. We also have to clean the fish. We are saved to be displayed. We are Christ's workmanship. We're his master craftsmanship. We are his poem. That's what the Greek means. We are to display him, to show him off. So here's a dead guy, Chris Weeks, who lived in death, believed, took the fork of faith, and now I'm in life. I need to start displaying his grace. That's what I need to start doing. Now, there's some question here in this passage, and I'll close with this. In this passage, if you notice, there's only really one verse about what I'm supposed to be doing. Why does he hammer so much on sin, so much on death, and so much on salvation? Why why don't we focus more on this new life in Christ? We'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think for one reason, because we so quickly forget how bad a shape we were in. And how bad a shape the world is in. I believe our job on here is really we are on mission to save people from their sin. When I was a little kid, so I was born, I was born in 1966. 1972, six years later, a movie came out. And uh, it was on the big screen. My dad went to go see it. My sisters went to go see it. But I was still too young to see it. And then the next year, they had it on TV. And if you guys, back, back, in the, back in the day, they had three stations, ABC, NBC, CBS. And they have movies that families would get together at night, like on Saturday night movie at 8 o'clock. And we'd all sit together and get popcorn and throw out blankets and watch it. It was like a big deal. And this movie's coming out on ABC. 
at 8 o'clock on Saturday night, the name of the movie, and I'm seven years old now, my dad says, yeah, he can watch that. Rita, you know. Don, it's too old for him. I can watch it, the name of the movie, and it's still, you guys are like, what's the movie? I just got to kind of lead you into this. It still bothers me to this day. It's called The Poseidon Adventure. Any of you guys ever heard of The Poseidon Adventure? This is the story of what I just read. If you had never heard of The Poseidon Adventure, there's this big cruise ship. It's cruising along, cruising along. It's New Year's Eve. They're having a party, and all of a sudden, a rogue wave, 150-foot wave, hits this cruise ship, and it turns it upside down. And in the main ballroom where they're just celebrating the New Year's Day, the floor becomes the ceiling, and the ceiling becomes the floor, and everything is turned upside down, and everybody's kind of like, what just happened? And they're holding their heads. Some people are bleeding. They're like, what's going on? And one person says, you know, they'll come and rescue us. Don't worry about it. And one guy says, no, no, we got we to gotta go now from, the, we got to get to the top. No, we don't. We'll be fine. He's like, no, the water's going to start coming in, and it's going to start killing everybody, and we need to go to the top. And only about seven said, all right, we believe you. We'll start going to the top. The rest just kind of waited to be rescued, didn't want to do anything, but the water started coming in, and it was terrifying. And as a kid, seven-year-old kid, I, I could feel the urgency. It's bad. You'd have all these people, like, suffering and they were drowning in the water because they thought they'd be just fine. And the only people that were rescued, they finally made it to the top of the boat. Only seven made it because they felt the urgency. Sin, like a rogue wave, has hit this world and everything is upside down. Everything is messed up. And what the Christians are saying is the water's coming in. Don't you see sin? It's wrecking lives. It's turning this soft white underbelly more and more. And we got to do something about it. And most people are like, no, 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 big deal. Everything will be fine. No! Because there's a time when that wrath is going to reach its heights. It says, actually, God is patiently waiting. When he finally gets to this level, he's going to unload wrath on people. And the only people who believe in Jesus will be saved. Why do I think the Bible speaks so much of sin? Because people don't believe it, because Satan's such a liar. But, in my mind, he's coming back, and I think really soon. The gospel is very simple. We're born in death, and we deserve wrath. If we, by faith, believe in Jesus like I'm eating spaghetti with a fork, I enter grace, where he's for me forever. Where do you stand? Are you over there or over here? That's the gospel.